At the conclusion of round three of the 2023 AFL season, there is a genuine logjam from 8th to 17th of 10 teams that have won one game. How do you separate the pretenders from the contenders? Who can fall? Who can rise? And all of those other things. That is exactly what this list is for. Here, I'll be ranking not only how they're playing now, but their future prospects in 2023 of all of those 10 teams. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Let's have a chat. Just before we get into the rankings, I am going live Thursday, the 6th of April at 6.30 p.m. A lead in to the footy to announce some massive things and talk some footy as well. Well, I am going to do a footy preview interlocked into this live stream as well. So it's not going to be all about what's happening with me and then we leave. You guys are going to get footy content out of it as well. So I hope you can join me then. There is just massive stuff that is happening and I can't wait to share all of it with you guys. So make sure you mark it down and join me when that happens. It'll be live here on YouTube. You won't need to go anywhere else. And that is all that I can really announce right now, but I'm looking forward to what's to come. But let's get into it. All 10 teams that have had one win. Number 10, I've got my Hawks. No one's expecting a whole lot from the Hawks this year. I really like their more open forward line that they presented against North Melbourne. But look, I know North were 2-0. They had a point differential of six. The sugar hit from Clarko. No Luke Davies, Uniac, and Joe Simkin. Yes, the Hawks, like I said, didn't really have a forward line. And they did dominate around the middle of the ground. The Hawks also nearly had 70 clangers as well. Their ball use was not perfect at all. And North just weren't good enough to apply the pressure and transition to their forward 50 in order to make the Hawks pay. I think against nearly any other opposition, the Hawks still would have lost given the momentum that they gave up in that last quarter. However, it was a great win. I'm happy as a Hawks fan, but I'm under no illusions. This isn't a springboard into a fantastic 2023, but they're also not tanking. So if we can end that right now, that would be awesome. But yeah, I still don't expect much from my Hawks. I'll take the wins as they come, but it's purely development. Number nine, I feel for them here, but it's West Coast simply because of the injuries. Jamie Cripps broke an ankle. Jeremy McGovern could miss up to three months. And Luke Shuey's done a soft tissue hamstring injury again. It's not going to look good for West Coast for a while. Why I took the eight and a half over in the preseason predictions, I've got no idea. Yes, you can't predict injuries, but that's just looking worse and worse by the minute. Fingers crossed that Adam Simpson can get something out of this season. And I don't think West Coast have the second worst list of the teams that I'm ranking here. But in terms of future projections, having key players out for significant periods of time are not going to leave them in good shape at all. So it is unfortunate. And after a really brave win in round two, I've got to put the Eagles here. Number eight, I've got the Giants. The Adam Kingsley round one amazing win in the heat was fantastic, but they've come down to earth in the last two weeks. If Stephen Cornelio isn't one of their better players, they're not providing much out of that midfield. Yes, Tom Green is a star. No one can take that away. But Cornelio's increased performance was increased result in the first two weeks. Yes, they didn't get over the line against the Eagles in round two. He was still one of the Giants' best. Toby Green as well needed to perform better. Nick Newman did an absolutely outstanding job, but five disposals in a game, Toby... He's just not going to cut it at all. I struggle to see where the massive development is going to come for the Giants in the short term. Could they get some wins in the back end of the year and rocket up the ladder? Absolutely, they could. I think that that is a very genuine way to think about things, especially with the Giants. But by the time we get to the bye, it wouldn't surprise me if the Giants are bottom two, bottom three, bottom four. I can't see a massive shoot up the ladder unless something significant happens that I just haven't seen yet. Number seven, I've got Gold Coast. They showed very little soul in their round one and round two games. Round three was better against the Cats, and this isn't an overreaction to the Cats game. The Cats look like they're just an older team that won the flag, and they've taken their foot off the pedal. And I'm not going to make a video smashing Geelong, actually, this week. I want to as a Hawthorne fan, but as a footy fan, I'm not going to. They've just won the flag. They can go 0-22 or 0-23 with the extra game. Who cares? You'd rather be a Geelong fan than any other fan in the competition right now. They're the most recent successful team. So go off, Geelong. Do what you will. Hopefully you do get something out of the year, and I do suspect that you're going to be fine. I would still be shocked if they didn't make finals. But back to the Suns. Lukosius has finally figured out his forward identity, and I don't think there's a player who has suffered more from being played out of position than the number two draft pick who was drafted as a forward that played forward for about 10 minutes and then stopped playing forward. 
His five on the weekend were awesome, including that 70-meter genuine bomb. Matty Rails back into some good form. Jared Witts is the All-Australian Ruckman so far. Yes, it's only three games, but that's just a fact. Took Miller does what Took Miller does, but I've been really impressed with the likes of Lockie Weller in his return game. Ben Long's been a good pickup, and when Ben King gets firing, I can see some optimism at Gold Coast. I still don't think they're playing finals. That's why they're so low on the list, but it's not the doom and gloom that the opening fortnight presented. Number six, Fremantle. I know they've just put 108 on the Eagles, but again, with Jeremy McGovern as injured as he was, and it's the Derby, they're always sort of Derby. I never know how to pronounce that. Someone from WA, please correct me. But in the Derby, I'm just going to go with Derby from now on. But in big games, in big spots, that midfield and their defensive back six are going to be fine. They really are going to be fine. Caleb Sarong won his second Ross Glenn Denning medal which is a fantastic achievement. Andy Brayshaw, one of the two best way midfielders in the league. Not a huge contested beast, but he can damage you on the outside, and he does consistently. And Luke Ryan right now is a genuine lock in the back pocket for the All-Australian team. He can be damaging. However, that forward six, I don't have faith in yet. And after round three, I don't see a reason why any non-Fremantle fans should either. Two really poor offensive games, and they've had one good offensive game against a team that lost defensive players. We'll see with Freo, and I can't justify putting them any higher than this. They've got an A-grade midfield, an A-grade back six, but right now, for me, it's not even a C-grade forward line. At five, I've got Port. I still think Port could finish anywhere between 8th and 14th this year, depending on who rocks up. But a team that's playing on emotion, as clearly Port Adelaide are right now, without a defensive system at all. And if you want to see a video on that, you can go check out my TikTok account at Daz Talks Footy, where I've got an exclusive, just little thing on Port Adelaide that I think you should check out. I just don't understand. Connor Rosie, Zach Butters, Xavier Dersma, who I think got subbed out on the weekend, which is a shame. They've got the youth. They do. They've got the veteran forward, you know, Charlie Dixon. Can he be like Taylor Walker at the Crows? They've got young talls, Marshall and Georgiades, albeit a little bit out of form. But at the end of the day, if they're not going to work hard defensively, they're not playing finals. It's as simple as that. It's up to Ken Hinckley to get the best out of this group. Can he in his what seems like 28th season at this point? Hard to say. Hard for me to put Port Adelaide any higher. I was tempted to put them a little bit lower. But there's just something about that Brisbane game that makes me think that's what they need to aspire for. And if they can't consistently get there, Ken just needs to go. Number four, the Bulldogs. I think it's going to take time for this Bulldogs forward half to gel in a way that I don't think can happen for Port Adelaide. This is an experiment. I understand that. But if Jamara is going to be able to hit up at the footy like that, excellent. We know what Aaron Norton is going to bring aerially and what a beautiful field kick he is as well. That hit to Bailey Williams to set up the sealer was an absolute peach with the mismatch with Will Ashcroft. But the doggies for mine are just going to take some time. Their midfield, a bit like Freo, A+. Plus. I do like what they did defensively on Brisbane, but again, that's going to take some time. But I get the feeling that the Bulldogs are going to be one of these teams that at the bye is going to be at like 6-5, and 7-5, and 7-6, and six, something like that. And then they might explode in the back end of the year and make a charge towards a 6th, 7th, or 8th placing. I don't trust them as much as I do the last three teams on this list. But right now, if I'm a Bulldogs fan, I'm happy with the performance. I'm not content with the start, but I'm excited for what's to come. Number three, the Crows. They could be 3-0, and but 22 goals, 34 in their opening two games cost them dearly with that third quarter against Richmond. They should have taken a four-goal lead into that break. Five goals, eight was not due reward for what they delivered at the Adelaide Oval. I tipped the Crows to beat Port very confidently. It was way closer than I thought it would be for the first three and a half quarters before they kicked away. I sold some of Riley Thilthorpe's stock in the round two review, and I couldn't genuinely have been happier for the man when he exploded. I'll happily be the reverse moles of the AFL if that's what it will take. And him, Fogarty, and Tex need to find a way to work together. And when you've got young smalls like Rochelle, Rankin, and Lukey Pedler, along with guys like Harry Schonberg, who can rotate through that high half forward spot, I love where the Crows are at. They do need to get their hands more on the footy, though, considering they're 13th for uncontested ball and 15th for contested ball. Meanwhile, they are 7th for inside 50s and a top 6 team in converting their inside 50s to scores. With more hands on the footy and more of it, Adelaide can play finals. I think their ceiling is at best 7th. Eighth is more realistic, but a ninth, tenth placing might be about where every fan figures the Crows will be. But if they take a step back from here, 
It's an indictment on Matty Nix, and both South Australian coaches could be on the chopping block. However, if I'm buying a team stock from outside the eight right now who didn't make it last year, geez, the Crows are looking good. Number two, I've got Richmond. Their ball use is abhorrent, and whether or not you agree with Kane Corns as a media performer, his Tim Taranto analysis is spot on. Now, Richmond aren't a team that have used the ball fantastically outside of Dustin Martin, of course, in the last six years. The problem that the Tigers have got is they are having now big periods in games where their pressure rating is dropping right off. If you're not going to be hitting every target by foot, then you need to be one of the premier teams in the competition without the ball. And that's simply not Richmond at the moment. Now, can they improve on that? Of course they can. Lynch and Rewalt really are shouldering a lot of the load in that forward half. But it's the lack of defensive intent from a Shea Bolton. Even Jack Graham is struggling defensively at times. And I do like the youth. Noah Cumberland cannot be the sub ever again. He could be the most perfect half-forward flanker in the competition. He could be what I think Jeremy Cameron is. And that is a high half-forward. He's a beautiful user of the footy and a good contested mark. Dan Riola is probably an All-Australian on the halfback or as the defensive bench spot at the moment. And there are bright spots. Toby Nankervis has had a great start. Gives away a few too many free kicks. But for Richmond, it's not panic buttons yet. But if this does fall apart, we can't say we didn't see it coming. But the best team from outside the eight so far is Brisbane. And they are the epitome of good list and bad between the years. I'm not going to give you the massive rundown on Brisbane as that was my last video, which is linked in the description and will be the pinned comment on this video. But between the years, Brisbane are not a good football team. Chris Fagan mentioned that they might have been thinking that they're a bit better than they are in the Port Adelaide game. But against the Bulldogs, they were horrific offensively for big periods. A lot's been made of Danaher and Hipwood. Gunston's been a good pickup with his three goals too. Dunkley, I think, had big moments, but overall wasn't as dominating as I think some media performers have made him out to be. But geez, there are some guys there that are struggling for form big time. But you can check out all that in my Brisbane video. I still think they're the best team in it because they can turn it around. I do now have some queries on whether Chris Fagan is the man to lead this squad to a premiership. Could they fall into the Port Adelaide Ken Hinckley trap of thinking we're almost there, but never quite there? potentially, but hey, it's round three. We got to wait and see. So that's it, guys. All one win teams ranked from 10 to one. What do you think? Comment below. Let me know. Let me know what team stock you're buying and who you're selling. Can't wait to see you for the live stream Thursday, April 6th, 6.30 p.m. Hopefully you're eating your dinner and checking in with Daz Talks Footy. If you're on the Eastern Seaboard, of course, take it easy, guys. Hope you're well. Hope you're safe. Looking forward to more content coming throughout the week. And of course, goodbye.